Uh, everybody, we are back for week three. It's amazing that it goes this fast. Um, I'm real excited to see what Show and Tell has got to do for us. So we're going to do our metal shop introduction quickly. And we have a few examples of metals to look at because metal is a, is a cool material. Uh, and there's a lot of variety and there's a whole bunch of them. And we're going to try and explore that a bit. But we're going to talk about some of the big picture ideas like we did with the wood shop, sort of identify the large tools that you might want to use. The categories and next week is more about like processes that you do in the metal shop. Um, but it, again, anytime if you have any questions, any thoughts, ideas, um, if we say anything wrong, which is totally possible, please feel free to jump in with ideas and thoughts that you have. So uh, first up, we're going to talk about identifying metals. And this maybe stems from my background as a chemistry teacher. Then we'll talk about metal tools, sort of manual tools and machinist tools and a distinction between those, and then working with metal, precision measurement, and starter metal projects. Because there's some, there's some really good ones, and then there's some that you can avoid and avoid a lot of heartache. So um, first up is just identifying metals. Metals are a thing that we're all well acquainted with in lots of ways, but not everybody is good at spotting them on site. That takes practice and experience. And there's a lot of different varieties. There's brass and bronze. You've got just like sludge and some steel, copper, cast iron. This one down here is lead. Um, and so lead's a, lead's a fun one. It tastes very good. That's totally not true. Please don't do that. But ancient Romans did put it in wine to make it taste better. Maybe that's why there's not ancient Rome anymore. Yeah, that's real. Uh, yeah, they did. The PB comes from the, the Latin word plumbum. Let's not do that. Which is literally for plumbing. Yeah, it's bad. Uh, my wife is from Michigan, and Flint has a real problem. Mm -hmm. It is not a joking matter, but it but it is weird how much it's tied to that part of our history. Um, identifying metals is useful, and so we have a few examples here that we're going to pass around. Two of them are kindly labeled by the facilitator Chris downstairs. There's aluminum, which is a very common one that you're used to seeing in your everyday life. And so aluminum, you'll probably know and love. Uh, some machinists don't even consider it a metal. It's too soft. They consider it like gummy metal-like material, sort of like American cheese is sort of like cheese. Interesting. And then titanium is really, really hard in the other direction. That's like, yeah. that's the titanium. Uh, and then there's a few other samples. That is a cold roll. That's a uh, iron. Some variety of steel. Some variety of steel. The cube is some other variety of steel. And then there's a gold one that's a brass, probably just a brass rod. And those we can just send around. So it's good to take a look at them. Confirm for yourself what you're thinking these metals are. Titanium, you'll notice, is really, really light. Um, it's used in airplanes and bike frames and all sorts of things. It's that's a, like I said, $80 worth of titanium right there in that little nugget. So it's it's a lot, uh, it's a lot of expensive. There's lots of ways you can determine metals. The colors, the density, sort of like how heavy it is for the volume, how hard it is. Not all metals are equally hard. There's brass pieces that are often used because they're softer than steel. And so if you want a specific part to wear in a machine, you might make it out of brass so that that part wears out faster than the steel in the machine. There's a lot of different things like that. Copper is one that's used. Um, it's antimicrobial. So people use it for things on roof, on a, on a roof, for downspouts, for pipes. It's antimicrobial, which is definitely good. Sorry. It's, not, it's all good. But if you're trying to put this, if you're trying to put this all into context, here's the periodic table, uh, 118 elements, and almost all of them are metals. Most of the elements that are out there, they're all metals. And so it will take a while to try and learn them all. The good news is, is that you don't, one, you don't have to. And two, um, there's like, you know, eight to 10 that float around in our everyday life on a regular basis. So the vast majority of those you could not or would really not want to hold a big enough sample like we have here in your hand. Yeah. 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 You, they're too radioactive. Not what you want. <laughs> yeah, other other stuff. But um, yeah, <laughs> our planet is a huge amount of iron, and iron is a major component in steel. Iron, raw iron, is an element. It's the Fe one on the periodic table. It was the example up here. 
And if you mix a little bit of carbon in, you get steel. And if you mix in a little bit of chromium with that, you get stainless steel and a few other alloys. So different mixtures have different things. It's also of the metals. It's a really incredible one because you can go real deep into the metallurgy of it. And we're not going to do that. Um, but this chart shows you the complexity that is metallurgy, that like heating up and cooling down steel can give it crazy properties. If you take steel and heat it up really, really, really hot, and then you cool it down really fast, it goes from sort of uh, wiggling, jiggling atoms to really tiny crystals that make it really, really strong, which is awesome for if you want a knife blade, but it also makes it brittle. So it shatters if it breaks. And so most of the time people get knives really hot, then quench them in oil. You've probably seen a cool uh, medieval movie where somebody does that with a sword. It looks really awesome. But then you also have to warm it back up so and keep it there for a while so that it doesn't just become a brittle sword. It needs to have some blend of those properties. Metallurgy is a whole lot to try and figure that out. But it's all based around this right here, which is actually a view of grain structures. So you can sort of see these little edges here. This is a microscopic view of a cut open piece of steel. And there's all of these strange interfaces where the, the parts lock together. And that microscopic structure is what you're manipulating when you heat and cool steel and iron in just the right ways. Um, also, it glows when it's hot, which is fun. So there's a lot to unpack with this. We're, we don't have anything this sort of a scale, but we do have a small forge where we can melt metal and do, and do other things. And we have a small induction forge. This is a... I think that's also an induction basin, but it's, uh, I think it, I think it's an electrical induction basin, but it is, um, we don't have anything near that size. I mean, that guy. More molten metal than you want to be doing. Cave and metal. Right, <laughs> absolutely. Um, another thing that's really interesting about metals is their hardness. Hardness is something that we all have a conceptual idea of that something is harder than something else, that a stone is hard, maybe harder than wood, a metal is up there for hardness. But it turns out not every metal is equal hardness, and it's defined sort of in comparison to other things. So some metals are harder than others. Like we said, brass is pretty soft. Gold, um, the, I just remember like the Looney Tunes, the old timey prospector that would bite a gold coin to see if it was really gold, because gold is actually that soft. Um, when you have a golden ring, like I've got a golden ring, it's usually 14 karat gold so that it is stronger than if it were pure gold, which is 24 karat gold. There's a weird metal carat rating system where it's 20 fourths by fraction for gold. doesn't make sense. Just one of those old ones. Um, in general, thinking about this soft and hard stuff, the soft and pliable metals are going to be able to bend and hard and brittle ones will stay very, very strong until they all of a sudden snap. This is generally true about things, not just for metals, um, but lots of the stuff that we deal with are metals. But if anybody ever snap a drill bit, they're a great example of a thing that's hard and brittle. They don't bend well, they just snap. And so if you're, because you need it to be hard enough to drill through whatever, drill bits might go through wood, they might go through metal. And so when you manufacture a drill bit, you make it as hard as you possibly can, and that, that comes with it, making it brittle. Um, or a lot of you got your lathe badge. The lathe has those carbide inserts on the end of the tool, those little like metal looking things at the end. They're actually ceramics with metal and some other stuff in there. Those are also really hard. And probably in your badging process, they said, be very careful not to drop these on the floor because they are so hard that they are also brittle. And so if those fall, they shatter and they break apart. If I didn't mention that, I should have... Um... Keep that in mind when you're using. Yeah. Um, but we've all crushed an aluminum can, right? Or bent, uh, tried to hammer in a nail and it didn't go well and it bends over to the side. Those are some metals are soft and pliable, some are hard and brittle. Uh, and some people who are very good at all of this have figured out really cool things to make the balance of that work well. Katana is a fantastic example. They're very hard and rigid on the front. And then they have like internal tension and the back edge is made soft and pliable a little bit so that they are like self-recovering blades with very hard, very long running sharp edges. Oh, your ring is Damascus. That's another fun process. Same color. It's the same, yeah, it's a whole bunch of layers that just get smashed together. Damascus steel is a really, really cool process. I'll put a video up. There's a 
there's a there's a fascinating dude on YouTube who makes them a bunch of Damascus blades. He like his knife works on YouTube funds his entire family, which is kind of cool. Yeah. Uh, but he makes really ornate blades, much more than we should try and go after this week. Um, another thing that's really cool for specifically steel are these tempering colors. So this is sort of where you start and then it goes this way. We're gonna lean into the chemistry. Um, steel is, it's a, is mostly iron and a little bit of carbon. And on the out, we've all had a car that's rusted at some point, right? Or been on a swing set that you're like, that is probably not safe anymore. Mm -hmm. um, those sorts of things happen. Um, but when you're tempering a piece of metal, it can happen very quickly. And so it doesn't really have time to rust. Rusting is a slow process. These colors that you get come from a thin film of an oxide, a thin film of rust across the surface. It's not really fair to call it rust. It's a thin oxide layer on the surface of the metal. And it turns out the way that the light bounces back and forth through that thin film gives you the color that you perceive, which is fascinating for a whole bunch of physics chemistry reasons that we're not going to get into. Um, but it means that you can look at the color of a piece of steel and estimate the temperature it got up to. So the reason that they have 540 degrees Fahrenheit under this blue one is because this color indicates that that was the temperature, because that's the thickness of the layer of oxide on its surface, which is wild. If you get the lathe or bridge port badge this week or next week or at any time, and chips start coming off of your pieces of metal, look at the color of the chips. You want them to be a bright blue color because it tells you two things. One, that the, the chips are taking away the heat and the color can inform you on like how much heat is leaving with the chips, which is incredible. Um, but this is these are, there's lots to learn in this realm. We're, most of us won't get in there. It's just fascinating to see why are there colors on metals and what's going on. Most of the, the color of the metal really is this. If you cut it open, it's always that. These are just outside coating layers. You can, if you don't like that color for some reason, this is sometimes called fire scale, uh, you can sand it off. This is a very thin layer on the outside. So to me, when you get like a, a metal that's got like a rainbow hue to it. Yeah. Uh, let's do... Welding heat rings. That's not what they're called. There's a special name for these. Uh, that's not not even close. Welding. So those are for TIG cups. Welding metal colors. Heat affected area. Yeah, that's what it's called. So in here, when you have a weld like this, that means you can see how this color goes from straw through that purple down to blue. If we bring that back to here, that's the color. So it was hottest right by the weld. Okay. And then it gets cooler as you go out away from the weld. And so that spectrum of color is there that tells you that we can, we can go way deep into this nerdiness. Um, but it's telling you that it was very hottest right here and it gets cooler as it goes down. A person who's getting very good at welding will pay attention to those color bands to sort of see how heat moves through the material. But let's keep, keep going. Uh, just trying to identify metals. The most common ones that you'll run into, the names that you should probably know are aluminum, brass, copper, pewter, nickel, titanium. Oh, yeah, yeah. Sorry, I had a question. Uh, so Akari's question, why does annealing soften metals and tempering hards them, hardens them? That's a really good question, Akari. The tempering and annealing comes back to the size of the grains. And the short, short answer is when you temper steel, you have it make very small grains, if I'm not mistaken, that make it very rigid. They don't bend or slide past each other super well. They just sort of form in place and freeze. And if you anneal it, you warm it back up and they sort of soften their edges a little bit and it becomes more pliable. Um, so imagine like freezing things into place when you temper a blade. It's so it's super, super hot. You dip it into water and it cools off super fast. So you get these real like spiky crystalline things inside that make it very hard. Um, and that's what makes it brittle. So they're, they're really well attached. Um, and I'm talking about the borders on these shapes that are kind of hard to see. Those are grains. And if you anneal it, those soften and they become easier to slide past each other a little bit. 
Oh, we should mute that. It's going to keep going on. Okay. All right. Uh, great. Uh, I think we did it. Yeah. Okay. Jared got it. Yeah, he did. Press the button on the side. We'll get it sorted. Um, Let's see. Pewter is one that's fun that we should talk about. Pewter is a fun metal. It's relatively affordable and its melting point is so low that you can, in the molding and casting area, you can cast things out of pewter. And in fact, I have, I carry around an example. I did this with Julia in 2020, 2021. It was a while ago. It, it was. It, you don't bring that bag out. I really, no, I do periodically. <laughs> Just a lot of stuff comes back in. Started off with this Animal Crossing uh, fossil, and then I capped it in pewter a couple of times. And so pewter is nice because it's got a low enough melting point that you can actually melt it and then pour it into a mold, which is of the metals that we're going to get to play with. It's a pretty rare one that you can do that. I mean, we have the equipment to do that with aluminum and a few other metals, but this is like stove top. Yeah, like you can do it at home and in your kitchen. Uh, nickel is another one that's fun. It gets used in coins. Titanium, probably not many of us will play around with this week. Zinc is all over the place. Pennies used to be made of copper, but copper has become too expensive. And so a, a copper penny now, if you cut it open, inside it's all zinc. It's just a copper coating, so it looks like copper. Zinc is like garbage levels of cheap. Um, but if you ever have a galvanized bucket or a galvanized nail, it's a zinc coating because zinc doesn't rust. It's already got an oxide layer, so it doesn't it doesn't actually rust. When uh yeah. So these are interesting ones. The ferrous metals, these are all of the iron-based metals. Iron is what most of the earth is made up of. And you mix it with some some carbon, some like charcoal, and you get steel, and you mix it with uh you mix it in different ways, you can get different types of steel. Stainless steel is is Chris's particular favorite. Uh, if you talk to him. He'll tell you it's a it's basically a precious metal. It's double the cost of regular steel, but it doesn't it doesn't rust. It stays very nice. It can be used in all sorts of different applications where you wouldn't be able to use other metals. Um, and there's a lot of places where that can work. Chris is, yeah, Chris knows what he's talking about. Down here, if you ever want it, this is probably the most expensive way to buy a thing. Um, but if you ever wanted to, you can go to McMastercard. They're, they are a, a massive industrial supplier. If we just search for metals, they have a really incredible inventory for all sorts of things. You can buy whatever kinds of metals you want, like your stainless steel. They have 5,000 products of just stainless steel. Uh, you can buy sheets and rods and wires and all sorts of things. If you really want uh, different, here's bearings of all sorts of stuff. You can buy anything you want to any specification. You feel like this is a really great industrial supplier. Their warehouse is in, uh, it was right next to Cleveland. So I got really used to getting stuff from them. They are going to probably charge more, but they have, will have like overnight shipping. And if you are a company that needed something, they're the ones you buy from. And that actually came up a little bit talking about wood, and it's true for pretty much every kind of material you might want to work with. Um, the people who will give you exactly what you want, exactly the shape and the type of thing that you want, are going to charge you more than the people who just have a big warehouse full of stuff and will let you run and drown. Uh, time is the money in, whenever you're buying material. So if you have more time to spend looking for what you need, you'll be able to pay less than somebody who needs this exact grade of stainless in this shape right now and can go on the faster car and doesn't mind paying 50% or more yeah. over what it might cost going to a warehouse and picking it out. Right. Uh, the piece of titanium came from a metal scrap supplier that, that Chris will recommend. And I will also recommend the Logan Steel Bargain Barn. Yeah. Walling. Bargain's in the name. <laughs> this is a beautiful place. I highly recommend making pills. Can you say that again? The Logan Steel Bargain Barn. I'm going to find it and put it in the. I also uh, added uh, this to our slide about middle sources. Oh, great. It's worth dropping in the chat as well. Yeah. Um, I will also probably make it. <laughs> 
trip up there in the next couple of weeks if anybody wants to carpool. Yeah. That sounds nice. Meriden. Nice. I got I got 119 Empire Ave. Uh, yeah. Meriden, yeah. That sounds right. Uh, so there's all sorts of vendors if you want to buy these things they come in all shapes and sizes i grew up in the rust belt and so i the apartment i had right before this i went to a grocery store that was in a shopping plaza named steel yard there was a giant rolls of steel everywhere huge beams of it all over the place everything was industrial steel production like within the the few square miles that i lived so steel production can come in any shapes and sizes Sheets, pipe, tubes, rods, bars, blocks, whatever, whatever you want to get. You can get all site, all sorts of things. We have a lot of square tube downstairs. So we have that. It's very helpful for if you want to make tables, you can do that. Um, but all of these different types are available. The vendors are here. I would also add to this, the scraps pile that we have is really good. Um, I'm a big fan of free projects. And the scraps pile downstairs is phenomenal. Just like recycling items, right? Well, like yeah. you could do stuff out of saw blades, horseshoes, like yep. building and creating, right? Yep. You don't necessarily have to go buy anything. You do not need to go buy anything. There's a lot of ways that you can get creative and find metal in your everyday life. Uh, even uh, Chris, because we can melt things, I think one of the last projects I saw him do, he took a bunch of scrap aluminum and melted it down into a big ingot which is just like a messy brick of the metal so that he could machine into it later. So he took scraps and turned it into something that would be useful. Um, so there's lots and lots of ways that you can get and acquire metals. You don't have to go buy it. If you want a certain, if you really want it to be exactly 0.035 inches thick, you're probably going to need to buy it. Um, but if you're like, eh, I just need a sheet of something, we probably have some. So there's a lot of different ways to get a hold of things and it's worth looking at them. And don't overlook the big box store if you're afraid to go elsewhere. But Logan Steel Bargain Barn is. I think we assume like small projects, um, holes, holes and has because they're kind of uh, they cater to the Yale Architecture School. Mm -hmm. They have like a lot, like a lot of individual little kind of extruded uh, shapes that are like weirdly specific. Like you can get tiny little I beams or tubes of varying sizes. I kind of. They have saved my bacon on more than one occasion <laughs> for doing anything sort of on the petite end of the scale. Yeah. Um, a good question was asked in the chat. Zinc and iron, the like sometimes people take supplements for those, exactly the same materials. Uh, and actually granulated iron is sometimes listed in cereal. It's little chunks of iron that make it into your cornflakes. Like you can put them in a, in a water and then stir it in a blender and then stick a magnet in and you get little grains of metal out. It's kind of gross, but it, we really do that to ourselves. <laughs> but you need it. It's what makes your blood red. Like, it's an incredibly functional part of how your body works. Chemistry is fascinating. Okay, <laughs> continuing on. Uh, let's go through some of the tools. Here are some of the manual tools in the metal shop. And this is a big list. There's no way we can fully and totally encompass a lot of these. But with your experience in the wood shop, some of these will feel familiar as analogs in a lot of ways. Like there's a drill press and here's a chop saw and here's a band saw. Here's another drill press. A lot of these have cousins in the wood shop and in a home shop, you may be able to get away with buying one and not the other. Here we keep metal and wood separate. Um, wood holds a lot of moisture. You bring it into the metal shop and now you've got a lot of rust. The metal going into the wood shop is going to dull the blades really fast. So we do a good job of keeping them separate from each other. Um, for those and other reasons. But there's all of these different types of saws and then the drill presses. These have their own sets of badges. And so this is going to be another badging bonanza week is basically what it's going to turn into. Um, you but also, when you're cutting metal with like a trap saw that you have there or the band saws, they're actually built really, they're built stronger because metal is just kind of, you can get away with building weaker structures for wood cutting machines. And they are uh, generally geared to run at slower speeds because when you're cutting metal, you wanna take lighter cuts slower most of the time where heavier cuts slower mm -hmm. will often be uh, what you are trying to do because it'll heat up really fast while you're cutting it. Compared with wood, you can go, quite a bit quicker 
So you'll notice if anyone gets badged on the Mel trap saw or the Mel band saws, um, the saws just run a lot slower than they do in the wood shop. Yeah, and it comes back to that color of the wood chip of the metal chips. Really, for wood cutting, you want to turn it into sawdust. For metal cutting, you're hoping to scoop off chunks of metal. And while you do that, sort of scoop the heat away from the base metal. Um, but that's a really subtle point that you don't pay attention to. You just you just cut like normal. Um, if you go really, if you're like timid and go really slow with one of those saws, you're heating up the metal and everything gets dull faster. So just just go for it. You'll feel when it's too fast or too slow. Um, but yeah. In addition to that, we also have some other things. Like if you wanted to cut, here's a plasma cutter. That's a fun way to cut metal. Uh, you're using a giant electric arc to cut right through. It's sort of like welding, but in the opposite direction. Uh, and also the water jet cutter is one of our cutting tools that is absolutely phenomenal. Do it. It's an hour long badge and the video is long and the software is terribly complicated. It's completely worth it. So worth it. Um, Cause you can cut through literally anything. It, we have it here in the metal shop, um, but it can cut through any material. We have a member who'd come in and they'd cut wood on the water jet because it cuts it and sands it at the same time. We have glass. Glass, it'll cut right through. It'll cut through marble, any not tempered. Uh, not tempered. Um, marble. Granite countertop samples down in the metal strip. Yep. 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 Piles, if you want. Ceramics work great. Uh, Acrylics on it, which is yeah anything really. anything yeah. at all if you're if you have no idea what to cut it on the water jet will do it um there is a cost to operating the water jet it's just a very expensive tool to run it's not a big cost but it's just a thing you have to do some bookkeeping so there's a for the electricity and the and the garnet that's like the sand it shoots water and sand and that's a consumable so there's a little bit of a cost but not you know it's like a couple of bucks yeah um, I don't think I've ever done a cut that was more than ten dollars. So, um, let's, so let's say you made major cuts on your thing. You have separated them apart. The next thing you might want to do is grind and shape them. And if that's the case, these are different tools that you might use. Again, they're they're sort of analogous things from the wood shop. Here's a a sander that is going to look a lot like the one that's the upright belt sander in the wood shop. It's marble. It's a grind. When it's wood, it's a sander. That's just kind of do it. Mm -hmm. And then there's some other ones that are interesting and don't show up much in the wood shop because in wood, you really can't bend wood easily. You have to steam it, do some things, and then it can bend. But in here, these will apply little crimps to get you to bend metal so that it separates out or it bunches up. So if you want a gentle curving motion to a piece of metal, you can absolutely do it with these two tools. This is an English wheel and a crimper stretcher. And people who build car bodies get really comfortable with exactly what those do. So they can make custom car bodies just like on the fly, which is kind of incredible. Um, here's a, a brake and roller. So this is one that has, I think a video is it for the badge, but it'll let you cut sheet metal. You can bend really precisely with a bender and then it's got the rollers on top. It's a really, really safe tool. It's manually operated. There's nothing to be worried about with that one. Uh, you're not going to have any surprises or anything happen. These, uh, the grinder things, they make really cool upgrades to products. You've got a grinding wheel over here, a polishing wheel, and a wire wheel. These are really great. As you use those, you have to be a little conscious of the fact that there's a, a lot of movement. And so you want to be careful that things don't get sucked into that wheel. But it's it's also going to be fine. Here's an arbor press. If you ever need to put a bearing into place on something, you can use that to apply a lot of pressure really efficiently. It works well. Um, joining and fastening metals. This is something that is important to talk about. Just like with wood, there was wood glue and screws and nails. For metals, there's a whole range of processes also. Like you can drill holes and tap and dye them so that you have bolts that go in. Um, an important thing to look at for metal is that they often have a different thread pitch. So screws like this, you can see these, are, these would be called a bolt. Um, because the threads are really close together. Those are meant to engage with metals. Um, wood, because it's not as strong, often has larger threads. And so this is sort of a screw thread where the, the threads are at a higher pitch. This is kind of an in-between, a self-tapping metal screw. Um, so it's a little bit in-between. 
but nuts and bolts are the sorts of things that you might use to hold metal together. In addition to that, you have these, which are rivets. This is a blind rivet where you drill a hole into things and then you push these through the hole and you do a little squishing action and it will take two pieces of often sheet metal and bind them together permanently. Um, it works really well. They're, instead of screws, they're, they're not like reversible. You can't back them out very easily, but they do a great job of holding things together. Uh, one, there's a lot of things about screws that are tricky. Thread pitch is one of them. And you, the more you play around and practice with it, the better you can get. But luckily one of the things that humanity did pretty well is we decided the angles of screws would be universal. Like there's metric and, and imperial threads on screws, which is kind of frustrating. But a lot of the time, if you pay attention, you can get things to work. And there's not a whole lot of crossover between those. We do, if you haven't ever, if you are thinking this week about screws, or you just want to go on a bonanza of organizing, there's a space in the back, sort of by the storage, where there's every single type of screw you'd ever thought of, and then more of them. Uh, and there's just a big pile that we have had interns here organize for unbelievable amounts of time. Uh, but they did it more. And then there's more to organize also. We have like everybody's pile of screws just gets handed to us, which is appreciated, but it's a lot. Mm -hmm. um, but it means that you can always find what you're looking for back there. I have not bought a screw since I've gotten here. <laughs> <laughs> so it's just there. Uh, you've got all of them. In addition to that, to join and fasten, some of the obvious ones are welding and brazing. We're going to talk a lot about welding and brazing. Welding and brazing and soldering, they're fantastic ways to put things together. Spot welding is sort of the littlest one. That's a video badge only, I think. Um, it's a pretty simple process. They put together battery packs for RC cars with a spot welder. But welding steel and brazing aluminum and soldering or sweating a pipe, those are really fun and empowering processes to have. Uh, just last week, we we sweated a pipe, right? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. And then if I could, actually, if I could recommend two badges and two badges only for this, for the next two weeks, would be water jet and the welding badge. And if I could add a third, probably horizontal bandsaw, just because it's a big, fun, like robotic saw. Um, but welding is a really empowering process. We have all the gear downstairs where you can put on everything so you're completely safe. You will not get hurt. You will, uh, the and welding, MIG welding would be my suggestion. So though there's other welding processes, but MIG is the best for a beginner. So those are how you do things, how you shape things, and how you fasten things which is a lot, and we know that we've just sort of glossed over, but those are sort of the tools and things you'd go after. But then there's this other entire category of what is a machinist. A machinist is something that's a tradesperson or a professional that is able to shape metals in lots of different ways, and they use certain types of tools, often in a metal shaping capacity. I'm from Cleveland, and there's lots of machinists in Cleveland, and many of my friends were, were very good machinists. If you make fighter jet parts as a machinist for the United States military, you have to be able to produce your parts within several, within a handful of thousands of an inch for specifications. If you try and sell one as being within spec and it's not, it's actually a felony. Like being a machinist is a fascinating process of exacting measures and very high levels of practice and skill. Good news is we got some of those tools right here. So if you wanted to learn any of that, uh, it also pays really, really well. Um, the metal tools for a machinist, they're going to use a different set of tools. Like the metal lathe is this thing right here. This is one of them. I went with a smaller one for this picture, apparently. This is called the king of all machines, uh, which has a, there's probably a YouTube video that this is linked to. Yeah, this is probably, if you want to nerd out on metalworking, this is a, a good one to watch. Yeah. That's an ad. But um, it's a video about how the lathe was the very first machine tool that was ever made in the 1750s in France. And it's the machine, it's the one machine that we have in the shop that realistically can actually, apart from the motors, recreate itself. So it's able to, with a lathe, you're able to build another lathe, all the way down to the screws, flattening things out if you get real creative. There's a lot that you can do with a lathe, but it's the only self-replicating machine that we have. Other things get close, but that's the one that does it. Um, then there's the mill, which is kind of like a lathe um, but stood up on its own. These two are really cool. They also have very long and costly badging processes. 
Um, there's because they have the ability to do lots of really cool things and to be able to cook through metal like it's butter. They come with a lot, a lot of rigidity and power, like to the point of if a wrench comes flying off of them, it's going to go through you. So you have to be careful if you're doing these. It's why it's a very long badging process. If you have any prior experience with these machines, you just need to submit some sort of written documentation that you have experience, whether it's like work history or a certification or any of that, and you can just turn on the machines. Um, but they're really, really useful if you need to cut through metal. They do a really great job and they do it, they do it really effectively. Um, I put three This Old Tony videos so you can sort of see what they do, even if you don't want to get in there and do it yourself. These classes run alternating like all yeah. the time. This month is Bridgeport, I think. Yeah. Alternating months. Yeah. Yeah, because it's we have one guy that does it. What's his name? Brandon. Brandon. Brandon, who's nice. He's great. He's a nice guy. Yep. It's like theoretically a whole day, but really a little less than a day. Don't be intimidated. It's a lot of fun. You get to use the laser, the bridge port after, which is super, super useful. There, yeah. One of these days, the class won't sell out, and I will actually take it. That is also tricky. <laughs> yeah, they you need to be sharp on the the update. To I just spot. it's my job, so like taking a ticket that somebody else would, you know. Mm -hmm. Uh, let's see other things, a tap and die set. This is how you cut threads into some things with a tap and die set, a metal CNC. There's a, the Tormach is this one down here. And that one's great to run. I have a, the badge for that one. And it's a lot of fun. Normally you have to go through the bridge port. I've got a bunch of CNC background, so you can also, there's ways around some of the strange requirements. My CNC experience lends that. Uh, and on this that we'll put a wax seal on your diploma at the end of foundations. And I milled it on that Tormac CNC. It's a lot of fun. The There's an end mill sharpener, a bench grinder, and measuring tools. A machinist is going to use this thing. This is this weird looking table is called a surface plate. That is definitionally flat. One of the things that a machinist really needs to think about is how do you measure things super, super accurately? And it turns out measuring things for distance is tricky, but also measuring like how flat something in, is is very complicated. That's a, I think that's an Air Force surplus surface plate, and it's not a table. Don't set things on it. Don't eat on it. Don't set, don't set stuff on it. Um, don't sit on it. It's, it is a measuring tool, even though it doesn't appear to be, it is the definition of what flat is. And so it has to be certified to a certain extent of flat. It's really just go like read the label on the side. It's fascinating to see what it is. Um, in addition to that, we also have a machinist may use some hand tools or anybody can use hand tools. There's the anvil, the hammer, handsaw, a file, a torch. All of these are very useful things in the metal shop. And just like there's some people who are all about hand tools in the wood shop, there are people who are all about hand tools in the metal shop, which is mind boggling to me. <laughs> um, it's just like a, a, a labor of, of love apparently. Um, but in here, you have all of these different options. We do have a large anvil. Um, in the welding area right next to the forge. So if you ever wanted to just like, you know, do a little ding, ding, ding on an anvil, it's, it is definitely fun to do. And you don't need to be embarrassed about just walking in and trying on the anvil for fun. It's good. <laughs> Working with metal, there's a lot of things to learn. Here's chips coming right off. On the bridge port, you might have a, a cutting insert like this where it pulls off little strips of metal. This is a gift, so it's rotating for forever, but it's that's the idea. Metals have these crazy internal structures, and it's very different from wood, where you have to think about the grain and how things work. Metal is sort of all one consistent material, like a, like a chunk of plastic might be, or like a ceramic might be, where it's all internally one piece. Um, thinking about how that works can really impact how you work with metals, but you don't have to think about things that you did with the wood shop. Like, am I using the router in the right direction for the grain of the wood is gone? If you want a flat metal table, you just make the flat metal table. You don't have to worry about whether the, the grain of the boards are up and down. All of that's disappeared. There's a lot of things that are made simpler because metals are just an element uh, at, their, at their most basic sense. But with that, they're polycrystalline. They're very hard. They work well in lots of scenarios. But safety becomes a, a big thing that we want to think about in the metal shop. Let's see. Ah, yeah. 
metals metals and plastics are actually a good point from the chat metals and plastics are really similar in that they don't have grain structure you're talking about things at a very tiny scale sort of the cells that make up a tree and make up wood they're a cell is bigger than the stuff that makes up plastic and metals and so the scale of the of a cell in a tree is big enough that you can almost see it there are some plants where you can literally see their cells but the Crystals of a metal or the, the polymers of a plastic are much, much smaller. So you get this uniform appearance, which is really cool. Safety is an important part of the metal shop. Uh, as you're thinking about the metal shop and doing things, we, I don't, we don't want to say this to be intimidating because the metal shop can be, and we're not trying to encourage it to be intimidating, a whole bunch of reasons. It really is something where you can think about just how to manage your safety while in the space takes a little bit more care than it does when you're in the wood shop, uh, like thinking about your clothing and different choices. Like while you're in the wood shop, you're going to want to look for where all the e-stop buttons are. They're the big red buttons that have the circular arrows. That's how you shut off the tool right now. It cuts power. They're very great. All of the tool control boxes have them, so you can cut off power that way. And lots of the tools have them even not through a control box. Um, in general, in the wood in the metal shop, you don't want to wear synthetic clothing, and that's because synthetic clothing will melt if it gets very hot. Cotton clothing usually takes little chunks of metal and they bounce off. So it's it's simply a matter of that. Uh, the metal chips can sort of embed themselves in the synthetics, and then they don't get off of you as fast as if they bounce off of cotton. So like what I'm wearing is is sort of what you'd want to wear in a metal shop. Which so one's presumably okay as well. The what? Wool. Yeah. Wool is good. Yeah, it's natural yeah. materials will burn. So if a really hot chip hits you, it might burn a hole, but it's not going to melt and stick to your skin. Yep. Uh, you really want to manage sleeves and hair and tie backs and all of those. So roll up your sleeves and tie back hair. Think about those sorts of pieces. You don't want them to dangle down. There you go. Adam is a, a great example. Not ideal. I always put my hair in a bun when I'm in. Either the wood shop or metal shop. Yep. Uh, impact related goggles are a must. You do not want to be in there and have a chip go into your eyes. You've only got two of them. You got to keep them nice. Uh, don't do not wear gloves, which is kind of surprising to people. Um, but if you remember from a couple of years back, Jimmy Fallon got degloved, and you don't want to know what that is. Uh, but keep keep your hands without things on them. And then you sort of know where they are. And if you happen to get close, too close, you're going to feel it. Um, not and not in a it's going to get cut off sort of way. But as you get closer, you have a sense of touch, right? Your fingers will sort of know when you're close to something that's problematic and it will be more helpful versus you have a glove that's very well attached to your hand and you don't know when the edge of that leather glove is getting a little too close to the grinder. You just don't have as much feedback as you do if you have gloves off which is, it gets a lot of people, they're often very surprised. When you're welding, you wanna have gloves on because you're worried about splatter. And so the splatter, you're keeping splatter off, but when you're using the bandsaw or a grinder or any of those sorts of things, you wanna have gloves off in the metal shop. That's also, also true in the wood shop, um, having something attached to your hand. If you touch the bandsaw blade, it's gonna cut your hand, that's bad if you have a, glove on your hand and you touch the band assembly, it's going to grab the glove and pull you toward the band blade, and potentially end up a lot worse than just nicking you. And that's true of every tool in both the wood shop and the metal shop that has a big moving cutting part. The, the like slower, more scoopy cuts in the metal shop make it a more relevant problem. The like tiny nibbles of the, of the wood shop make it a little less of a concern in there, but it's still the safety, the same safety standard. Um, also, before you turn on a tool, know exactly how to shut it off. Uh, I had, I inherited a jigsaw uh, when I first moved out on my own in Ohio that was from the 50s and it had a lock on mechanism that was terrifying. <laughs> yeah, uh, there are some, uh, no, it was like the, the like, beautiful chrome silver body that was big and chunky and metal really cool tool really a death trap uh so 
we luckily we don't have anything that's like that downstairs but you'll want to definitely, definitely know how to turn the thing off before you turn them on. Uh, another thing about our metal shop is that we have a lot of tools that are buddy tools. And that a buddy tool is not that somebody has to be right next to you while you're using it, but somebody should be in the room while you're using it. So that way, if, if you need to yell and get some support, there can be a person that's there. So if, you know, Adam and I were working on different parts of the metal shop and there were just two of us, we can just go for it and do our thing. And, and be aware that the other one's present. And that's a crucial distinction with the wood shop. If someone's in the main space because there's all the windows into the wood shop and it's a lot more visible, and someone in the main space can be your buddy. So just if you're alone in the wood shop, you can let someone in the main space know um, and then they will count as your buddy. They will be aware if something happens to you, you'll be able to get their attention in the metal shop because it's kind of more sealed off, um, you need to have someone in the metal shop with you when you're using the tool. Um, that being said, there are a lot of tools in the metal shop, um, like the bridge port, a little more uh, higher tier, but the larger as well, where uh, they're buddy tools, but you're, a lot of your time on the tool, you're spending setting up. So it's only when you're actually, the tool is on, it's cutting, moving, that you need to have someone else in the space with you. Yep. Also, there's a big TV downstairs with a camera into the metal shop, so you can sort of see what's going on. Well, I don't think we count it as a buddy yeah. if you're watching through the screen, but it's kind of fun to see what most of what Chris is up to in there. It's it's you find Chris when I'm right. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. See on the screen. Yeah, you know? yeah. Uh, okay, and so let's say you're doing all this, you're feeling safe, you're feeling good. Uh, next up is precision measuring. Measuring is something that in the wood shop is important to do, and I feel like it becomes extra important in the metal shop because things are often more expensive or you can get to exacting measures. Um, and so it's something that it's worth just taking a moment to pause and think about how well do you know how to measure? Because it's really a skill. Um, and if you want to met people who are very good at it can, can Chris, for example, we keep talking about Chris, uh, he can make a cut in a piece of metal after he's drawn on it with a Sharpie and make a cut that removes three quarter of the Sharpie thickness. He is insanely good at measuring and getting precision cuts on things after years of practice. I would not even be close to being able to do that. Uh, and then I have, I have delightful high schoolers that are still learning their way in the world as all high schoolers do, who have a hard time with a ruler. So it's good to just check yourself and make sure that you know how to measure things as well as you want to especially if you're trying to get to exacting measurements. So like getting getting the right placement for a hole if you want to put a screw in, trying to align things, especially if you're starting to measure things in two dimensions, uh, like laying out an area of grids, there's some skill to that. And it's worth really taking a minute to think about it if you've spent a bunch of money on a piece of metal. Um, along with that, one of my favorite measuring tools are calipers, and these are great. There's a video that you can watch to get introduced. They let you make three different types of measurements. And these are dial calipers in the metric system that let you go down to, it looks like uh, hundredths of a millimeter, which is very, very small. These would let you measure at school to try and convince kids how useful these tools are. I tell them, pull a hair off your head. And then we measure how thick it is. These tools are able to measure at exacting precision and learning how to do that is very, very helpful. These larger teeth, they let you measure things between the two teeth. These smaller teeth on the back, they measure like the openness, of how big a hole is. You stick them back into a hole, their measuring surfaces are these flats over here. And then this one lets you measure depth. As you get better at this tool, they become really useful. I carry one, I have one in my bag right now. I, it's one of the things that I do carry around. They come in all sorts of varieties. Those are dial calipers. And I have uh, bevel veneer calipers. These don't have a dial and they're really like probably more an homage to my science background than anything else. But these have a different way that you measure how, how things are. They give just a simpler mechanism for high precision. So this lets you measure how things, how big things are that way. Um, this lets you measure between those two. And then this is usually a depth gauge lets you measure how far it is between this surface and that surface. 
So these can be really helpful if you're trying to measure things. These ones in the metric system, and I mostly use them for metric, they get down to hundredths of a millimeter or 128 of an inch. So really high precision on something like this. We can definitely measure the thickness of a hair later if you feel like it. Um, but some starter projects. Definitely, I would recommend strongly, you should try and get your first weld in. It's fun. Uh, you feel like you're of one of the one of the Norse gods molding metals into what whatever you want them to be. Uh, it's a lot of fun. It, there's a lot of sparks. You with the mask on, you go blind temporarily, and then you can see again. It's fat. It's a lot of fun, and it feels high stakes. It's definitely fun. Um, just laying a bead of weld is is a good time. Sheet metal cutting and bending is great. Using a saw and file to shape soft metals is really good. You can create a knife from just a just a blank piece of metal. You can make a knife from just a plate of steel. You can make wind chimes from pipes. You can do, uh, you can weld up a table base if you want. We had somebody do that last year. The table base is downstairs, or you can make jewelry. We didn't, we didn't get into, and I, I am remiss that I didn't add jewelry slides to this. There's an entire jewelry area. So if all of this feels like sort of big scale metal, it's because it is the the jewelry shop is still pretty new. And there's two fantastic jewelry facilitators if you want to go deeper into jewelry. Um, and they have their own entire smaller collection of these tools, basically. There, it's Lisa Krasno, who did foundations last year, and Ada Wilderman, who did foundations the year before. They're both professional, or Ada, I know, was a professional jeweler, and Lisa has done it for decades. So they have tons of experience. If you want to make jewelry, you want to make chains, you want to make different interesting shapes, they're both fantastic people who are really experienced and you can do a lot, you can learn a lot from each of them. I am not a wealth of knowledge on jewelry making um, and should, should just add more. I will put in more slides and, and give more information about that. Um, have you made a lot of jewelry, Adam? I took a class three or four months ago and that is the extent of my jewelry experience. Yeah. I've been meaning to do more. I'd love to do some uh, soldering. Uh, I have a few projects in mind that maybe some of the brass for, but it's uh, a lot of fun. I've mostly done, my metal working has been in the ferrous metals for the most part. The jewelry area is the non-ferrous metals, very specifically. Um, you don't want to use anything that contains iron in the jewelry area, but you'll learn if you start getting bad. Yeah, it's it's in the metal shop, but it's definitely its own separate shop. It's literally curtained off. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Question, I'm looking at the badges online, and it says that you have to either have prior jewelry training experience or you've taken the basic jewelry orientation. Yes, and the basic jewelry orientation is you show up, and Lisa or Ada sort of walk you through what's there. No, we have a whole class. Oh, there's a whole class? A class. Oh, fuck. It's Saturday. Oh, all right. Great. It's, it's this Saturday. It is sold out. Oh, okay. Sorry. Yeah. Um, Not very helpful. But if you wanted to get in and do one or two things, I I know, I know that both of them would help you do something. Okay. Uh, they're they're very kind, supportive people. And uh, both, each of them is a delight. So I would I would reach out. Thanks. Do you know that... Lisa or Ada? Uh, Ada. You talked to Lisa. Or, no, it was Ada. It was Ada. It is only here on the times that she has right now because she's doing something with school. So she yep. said that she's limited to just that. Yep. But she is super helpful. She is very, very helpful. She's in an architecture program at Yale. And so she's very busy with that. Yes. The um, but Lisa has a little bit more flexibility, and I would I would reach out to either of them or try and schedule to be in when they're here. They have tons of experience if you're into that. Uh, there is a bit of gatekeeping on getting into that space, but once you're in, it's really cool. Uh, I've watched Lisa just like ah, do, do, doing a thing, and then she just cranks out this beautiful copper chain that she makes on the fly. Um, it's a really cool set of skills. And I would encourage you just to like have a conversation with, with them if they're here to see what they're up to. Um, there's also a ton of really cool things that you can do sort of without that training. Uh, Julia, you posted a chain mail thing. 
Yes. Recently? Uh, yes. Yeah, a class. friend of mine is actually teaching a chainmail basics course where you learn how to weave with the links to make different patterns. Um, it is it is like so weirdly fun. Like it seems fiddly, but um, if you're into anything that kind of has that sort of like repetitive meditative quality, like, you know, knitting or throwing or, you know, lathe stuff, um, it's, it's just that same kind of field. So it's on the whole yeah it's like i think first saturday of february yeah so it's coming, so it's, up, yeah. It's coming up yeah and it's all using aluminum rings so yeah. i think she's teaching like two different yeah products. there's one that's like very chain mail looking and then another is just like a like necklace chain yeah. which i'm super into yep making learning how to make your own chains is a very achievable thing that would be a good on-ramp to the jewelry station, even though you may not be able to do it directly in the jewelry station. Mm -hmm. It's a thing that you can also just do like, you know, sitting, sitting on the couch. Um, so those are, those are great things also that aren't inside the metal shop, but that would be sort of there. The jewelry class, when we have our next available open one, which I'm sure we'll keep everybody posted. Uh, but those are, those are great things to do also. Uh, dog fooding. This is, we, we need to keep our speed going. This is a great example. I bring this up because Lior does a lot of it with the metal shop. Dog fooding is from eating your own dog food is an idiom where an organization uses its own product to make the things that it needs. And so in the case of Lior in our metal shop, he cut on the horizontal bandsaw and then welded together those tables in the main space downstairs. So he's able to use the metal shop to make things for Make Haven. There's a lot of stuff around if there's a weird a, a weird example around it's probably Leor probably made it um Leor is making a new gear that got stripped out in the big metal lathe down there he cut the gear out and engraved it on the tormach <laughs> next is going to cut the actual gears into the edge yeah cut the teeth with it and it uh, of course says make haven on the side instead of delta or whatever the old gear says yeah why, why wouldn't you brand it <laughs> Uh, it's a really good thing to do with the shop is to make things that you need for, for projects. Next week, we're going to cover sort of processes. And so this will include soldering, brazing, and welding. That's going to be sort of a deep dive into how you do that for jewelry, specifically the soldering and then brazing and welding. We'll talk about a bit more tempering basics. We do have a tempering, a little, a little kiln oven for tempering knives in the metal shop. So that's neat that that exists. Lathe and milling basics, so like how you'd make choices there. A CNC sort of big picture overview. We're going to talk about CNC a bunch throughout the course, uh, which is computer numerical control. We'll get into that. And water jet cutting we'll talk about next week a little bit more. Electroplating, which is a really cool process that's like right on the border of chemistry, um, where you're depositing metals on top of other metallic or conductive objects, um, often to make them look cool. And then uh, welding and sort of the welding processes in addition to just like the conceptual overview. So uh, your goal this week, if I were to pick just a few, I think these are all good ones. The MIG welding badge, the horizontal bandsaw and the metal angle grinder. If you got those three, you could absolutely go after projects. The water jet is another one. It's a long badge. The, the welding badge is a little shorter, but that one in like a half an hour, I think. I think it's an, almost an hour. Is it almost an hour? I okay. feel like it is. I feel like I started to watch it and was like, yeah. <laughs> it's good. That was a good one to do in groups. The good news is our facilitator schedule for the metal shop has grown substantially. And so makehaven.org and then community facilitators. We'll just do this. And then the, oh, I need to log in. Let's do that over here in case I need to actually log in. Do, 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 do. Okay. Um, facilitator schedule. So in here, our metal shop facilitators are available lots of the different, lots of days. So we have our, uh, Ada is in on Mondays from six to nine. And so she's around then Mara is in on Mondays. Mara is also here on Thursdays for brewing and on lots of other days, Mara's around a lot for the metal shop and she's great. Then we've got, Chris is in every day. Um, you're, I would be surprised if you stood up and Chris wasn't here. If you're here during anything close to normal business hours or in early evening, we've got- I got here before him one time. Yeah, he's here always. 
and it was weird. <laughs> yeah. Uh, here's Elena, who is also very good, and she's Tuesdays. And let's see, we've got Lisa, who's in on Tuesdays as well, and Jared, who's done some wood shop things with all of you, probably is in on Wednesdays. So we really have lots of the days are covered with the metal shop, and we'll make sure that all of this is posted so that you know exactly what days are the most useful to come in and see people, but earlier in the week is probably going to be the time to do some badging. So flash back to that badge list that you had up. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, here's MIG welding and the horizontal bandsaw. Those two would be really good. Also, the water jet would be one that I would add in there. Let's add it in. Oh, oh, oh boy. <laughs> that was not what I wanted. The water jet is another great one to add in. But it would be, you know, you may or may not weld things right off of the water jet. Um, sort of, there's a story to MIG welding and the horizontal bandsaw and the metal angle grinder. Those three, and you've got a welding project that's done. A good example is I used those three to make the shelves in the front window this summer. There's some weird white painted shelves held up by one steel bar and some cables. I made that in the early summer, and it used exactly those, those three originally starred tools. I used the horizontal bandsaw to cut some square tubing that was downstairs. Then I welded them together with MIG welding and then used the metal angle grinder to make it clean and easy to look at. And then a little bit more angle grinding with a with a sanding disc and turned it into a nice shiny piece of metal. So you can really make some things that are cohesive with just a few of these badges. It's unlike the wood shop where it really helps to have a large suite of them. In the metal shop, it can often be that you just need one or two badges to really make a good project. So you don't have to try and go as crazy just collecting all of them like Pokemon. You can you can just go after the ones that you really want to try and explore. So for like the chimes, what would you need? Uh, for the it depends on how big you want for the chimes, but uh, the metal chop saw if you're doing like little copper pipe chimes would be good. Or if you wanted big like you want to go buy a black steel pipe out of Home Depot or Lowe's. You could use the horizontal bandsaw to cut them off at like four foot lengths and do big, big chimes if you really wanted to have a big set of chimes. You really want big ones. Yeah, little little copper pipes would be totally fine. And what would you use for the little ones? You could you could do either the the small chop saw that was up here at the top, or there's even a, a pipe cutter, a little tiny this this um cutoff wheel or the metal chop saw. Those would be good for pipes. There's also just a pipe cutter if you're used to that from maybe home plumbing, if that's your jam. Uh, and so you can you can totally use those as well. Making getting wind chimes that are in tune, there's a bit of an art too, but that's where the grinder might be helpful. So you get close to the size and then use the grinder and then you you sort of tap them and listen and tap them and then grind some more and then you tap them and listen if you want, you know, full proper harmony in your wind chimes. If you're if you're that musical. See your potential. <laughs> You know, oh yeah, that'd be great. Well, you just cut some different ways. Yeah, there's there's totally a good relationship where you can figure out exactly how long they need to be. There's a lot of fun options with that. There's a symbol maker at Gilford. Whoa, that's wild. It has his own shop. Yeah, I haven't seen it, but I I worked it twice. That was like turns kind of a. Yeah, I had to describe the process to me, and I, I meant to go check it out. But um, yeah, the former librarian at hand, oh. her husband makes symbols. That's wild. Yeah, he's got a show. They always have that certain pattern, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. it's, a, it's a lathe like process, <laughs> but you start with a sheet and then sort of push. Or it's kind of like throwing with metal. It's kind of like throwing <laughs> with metal, um, but it's one that like I'm regularly heard that that one is like ultra dangerous because it's spinning at high speed. And then if you punch through the thin piece of metal, yeah, now you got flying razor blades. Um, My uncle, yeah. yeah. My uncle is a drummer slap tinkerer, yeah. and he just bought a great lathe for making symbols. Yeah. It's a, a specific kind of lathe that's for working on break discs, and apparently it can also be used yeah. to make symbols. Oh, that makes sense. Cool. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In the Midwest, break lathes were very common. People would absolutely yeah. turn them around yeah people a lot more people using them to make breaks than symbols but <laughs> one of those fun crossover yeah no that's great yes ladies 
He's, uh -huh. he's in drummer's world with his 22 inch lathe drive. Yeah, that's awesome. Cool. Uh, so we went through sort of the orientation to the metal shop. And the big thing is just pick a couple of badges. You don't feel like you need to get the 10 or 12 that you might have gotten if you really went crazy in the wood shop. Like two or three will be plenty in the metal shop for lots and lots of projects. Um, uh, we'll see you around this week and feel, feel better. <laughs>